all of you will know what Milton's most known for is the I Heart NY logo. But obviously Milton has created so many icons throughout the decades that we're not even aware of it. But what's most interesting to me about Milton is the amount of minds that he's opened, he's inspired, and he's pushed to go and achieve their hopes. So, one of the things about this evening we really wanted to bring from Edinburgh Napier University was diversity. And when I look in this audience, I see a great array of people from different walks of life. So, ladies and gentlemen, can I ask you to put your hands together for Milton Glazer from New York? Hello, everybody. Glad to be here with you. Although that doesn't make much sense. That's, I'm not really here. I'm here. And you're there, but I am with you. In the short time we have together, I'm going to tell you everything I know. And I hope that to be of modest interest. I'm going to go through a little series of images to talk about, um, A, my working method and how I think about things and to show you how one thing leads to another. And to introduce an idea which perhaps many of you are already conscious of is that there are no unconnected events in human experience, <clears throat> that everything is connected. It all comes out of the same moment in universal history. It's made out of the same stuff. There are no unrelated events or unrelated objects or unrelated personalities. There's a thread of connection between everything. And one of the things I must say you do as a designer or a person involved in communicating ideas or thinking about ideas is that you discover the hidden relationship between everything. In fact, for me, outside of the fact that I love making things physically and seeing what the miraculous comes out of. The great thing about being in the arts is its capacity to discover what is invisible in daily life. And in order to be in that state of mind, you have to be attentive. In short, you have to pay attention to what's going on, and that's extremely difficult to do particularly in our time. There's everything that occurs in your life basically is aimed at making you inattentive. Certainly movies, books, television, and anything else you can mention. One of the things that brings you back to attentiveness, curiously, is drawing. Because when you draw, in order to understand what you're looking at, you have to pay attention. Although many of you have seen innumerable drawings that are the consequence of not paying attention. But what I'm going to show you now is a sequence of ideas that sort of lead inevitably from one to another and take you down a path, a path that you actually don't experience until you embark upon it. So let me show you some stuff. This is a, a brush drawing I did of a guy named Rudy. Rudy was a teacher of Kundalini Yoga, which is linked to other forms of self-observation. He was a very strange man, actually a Jewish boy from Brooklyn who reinvented himself to, to become one of the great teachers of Kundalini Yoga. And this is a drawing I did of him in the first year of my knowing him. It experiences, or it shows, the experience I had dealing with the ferocity of his character. The idea behind Kundalini Yoga, among other things, is to create a flame so intense that the ego is destroyed by burning. Years later, I did a jacket for his book. Do you want to? 
It's a grass here. It has the great name of spiritual cannibalism, which relates the idea that everything ultimately must be consumed. I studied with them for a long time, and it's hard to describe what the experience of studying Kundalini is except for the fact that you're changed by the experience. And when Buddhists speak of detachment, what it really means is you don't get overwhelmed by your emotional life as a response to external conditions. As a consequence of my answer, uh, my interest in the subject, years later, I got to work with the Rubin Museum here in New York on 17th Street. I developed an identity for them, Rubin Museum of Art, which is based on the mandala that frequently occurs in Buddhist painting. Uh, ultimately, that was applied to the entry of the museum. Here is a drawing of Tibetan clouds, which was the inspiration for an entrance wall. This is a paper cutout of the wall, which is simply done on a piece of gold paper. What's interesting is what happens from this position in the path of a problem to its ultimate form, and this became this. It's illuminated from inside, so you see the lines of clouds now become light, reflected off the curved surface of the screen. I was then commissioned to do a series of prints for the museum, and I used some of the tantric imagery that Buddhist art employs. What was interesting to me and still uh, retains an enormous interest is how something that is identical in every respect except for color has a totally different meaning. This may be obvious to many of you, but when you see the spirit that one print evokes based on a dark palette and realize that the meaning of that, whatever we mean by meaning, the meaning of it changes totally when the color changes, without any other form changing, without any, uh, anything except tonality and color being affected, how your experience of the prince is totally different. The outside signage is based on the idea of, of the color effect, the red against the green, and this extraordinarily powerful event where the red leaks through the green bars behind the words walls are. The power, that, the power of that red is almost like rushing water. Later I got to do a, uh, a poster for the International Buddhist Film Festival where the Iconography was simple, it was just the idea of the radiance of the mind of the Buddha formed a triangle of red. And then replicating one of the themes, the recurring themes of Tibetan art, the Thousand Buddha painting, where there is a painting of the Buddha in a thousand forms. Uh, I just repeated that image to create a conversation between the large forms and the small so forms. And to acknowledge the extraordinary effect, for instance, that this little ball of yellow has at the top of the Buddha's head. And then its repetition as a series of dots in the background. These abstractions evoke tremendous emotional response. Even though what you think you respond to subject matter, 
there's virtually no subject matter. There's only a kind of abstract version of the idea of the Buddha's head. But that's what moves our emotional life. Let's go on. And then I had to design some rugs for the interior of the museum. And this was one rug sort of based on some of the references of color in the vocabulary of information that I had designed. And then I began playing around a little bit with color and color change as the main factor in doing these prototypes. Let's go on. So you see how you go from that dark one to the light one and everything changes, or simplification where everything changes. Or there's a rug in my home, which is based on the print, now translated into a physical object with a different texture. And all these manifestations come out of one source, but everything changes constantly as the medium changes, as the color changes, as the attitude changes. Those two cats in the background are by Steinle, two marvelous lithographs. Let's go on. A work that uh, affected me deeply as a student was this Tatlin homage to the Third International, which was never constructed. It was supposed to be a series of three buildings on the inside of that roadway that were revolving, and the roadway served as a transportation system. Cars would run up to the top and then be transported down to the bottom again. It was exhibited all over the world, but never built, for obvious reasons. <laughs> Thousands would have died as a consequence. Nevertheless, it is one of the great icons of modernist art. And I thought I would use a version of it to sign the theater for the School of Visual Arts, who I've been teaching forever, uh, for a new movie house they had purchased. So here are my individual studies. Can you go back? Uh, the first was kind of representational with ramps going up and the buildings revolving, and then just a kind of tapered pole with the uh, striations. And then finally, the sketch on the right for the object on top of the marquee and the trademark. So let's go on. And that's the mark, and that's the actual object. And at, on the hour, every hour, the forms begin to revolve around each other. And as you can see, it's even larger than the Empire State Building. <laughs> and it tells the time, once <laughs> on the hour. OK. And then a preliminary study for the whole surface of the theater. And the plan was to do a mural about the secret of art, whatever that secret is, but I've already told you. And the uh, identity of the theater to the right. That was proposed to a board of the city to determine whether it was a mural or a sign. If it was a sign, it could not be posted. If it was a mural, they would let it be put up. About nine ago, years ago, the question was put to the board, and they still have not answered as to whether it was a sign or a work of art. This is just a funny example. When we started tearing the theater down, we discovered there was a big vault about eight feet high above the ceiling. And we ripped it out, and I said, let's leave it. And let's not put the ceiling back in, which we did. And then I got a photograph of the interior and just took some colored paper and put it on various points over the photograph. And I'll show you what the finish looks like. And what is amazing is sort of how everything implicit, which is, say, those little scraps of paper, became realized. This is now done on uh, bent metal and painted with enamel. And it has exactly the same feeling 
as the very first sketch in scraps of colored paper. I experiment a little bit with the idea of painting these elements with an illusion of light, which is to say the dot pattern became a symbol of light. And then when these panels, metal panels, were used in a bar, just show you, this is a study. So you see the effect of luminosity huh? coming only out of dots and a background. And then I made a bar out of it. And the interesting thing here is the play between real light, because the light is behind that gold bar at the top, illuminating these reflective panels. And what is the relationship between simulated light, which were the dots, and real light cast upon them? You might say, is there a way of representing light without using light? Or any such question you'd like to generate. So this is what it looks like in the theater, yes. And that it's the only object in the space, but it completely defines the space. And again, continuing with this idea of what happens only through color. This is another print based on an ordinary vocabulary of dots and lines. And what's interesting again is to see what happens to this print when only the color changes. Let's see the next. And you are suddenly in a different universe with different emotional content and different effect. And nothing has changed except the color. And here's another example of a pattern. I've come to adore patterns and I've come to believe that Persian and Islamic rugs anywhere from the 15th to the 18th century are among the greatest works of art ever created by man, including the Last Supper. We are so parochial in our vision that we recognize these as home furnishings instead of the great works of art that they are. In any case, this is a floral pattern in one color range and then taking it to another color range where you have to wait a little while before the color appears. And then this idea that looking is not seeing. When you look, you are not necessarily being attentive. You're not paying attention to what you're seeing. Seeing occurs only through attentiveness. It means you have to look at things very often for a long time. And the same idea applied to a geometric pattern. What's interesting here is how those black holes in the middle of the pattern have materialized even though they don't exist. The idea of creating things that don't really exist is one of the great fascinations of works of art. And taking that idea and using it in application, in this case, a background pattern, and then using the O's as a thematic idea to carry through for the entire surface. Here's another example of how mysterious the illusions are that one creates. If you look at these long enough, a crazy pattern, a rippling pattern occurs across their surface, almost like waves. They don't exist. There's nothing there except the difference in the width of the thin lines. And by virtue of that difference, the tonality of the surface is disrupted and these waves appear, they don't exist. They exist only in the brain in its capacity to transform reality. Let's go on. I took one of these, you could see the patterning more clearly here, for a poster for the school called The Secret of Art. 
and it's crumpled up, and you see the secret is contained within the crumpled form. But the interesting thing about this is really where those waves come from. Sometimes it's interesting to see how much lusciousness and color you can bring to something that has no color in it. I love the, the spirit of this, even though the color intensity is so close as to be almost invisible. And the idea that there was a little game, I always love it when there's a narrative below the abstraction. Incidentally, when I see anything abstract, I long for realism to fill it out. And when I see anything real, I long for abstraction to explain it. So that relationship between abstraction and reality is always a fascinating relationship. But here, for instance, discovering that there was a musical notation contained within the, the shell that I simply isolated that from the shell itself and it became music by the sea is one of those fortunate relationships that you can discover if you're attentive and open-minded. And this is a, uh, an alphabet. I did a long time ago. Mm -hmm. Like many things I've done in my life, it, it was uh, not solicited, nobody asked for it. It was not a commission, but I managed to enter into sort of graphic light, life by itself. And somebody started manufacturing it in several weights. But I've used it occasionally in my work, and sometimes I take something, not only sometimes, but frequently, take something I've done in the past and reapply it. I'll show you an example where I took this, the letter four from the alphabet, and took a pattern I had uh, designed for something completely different, and made a poster but that was a commission for someone who wanted a number four. I don't recall what the commission was. But the combination of things that are unrelated at the beginning, and that you, see the relationship in the intrinsic nature of the two or three or four objects is a great pathway to discovery. I started doing Shakespeare portraits uh, for no particular reason, but I then got a commission from a theater that performs Shakespeare and was able to begin utilizing some of these drawings. Let's see. The first one was a poster for the theater. I also had this Shakespeare bust in my house, unused and unappreciated. And I made little stickers out of the uh, portraits. And that became their announcing uh, their new location. And this is the front of theater with a hanging system of changing signs, uh, changing the portrait of Shakespeare whenever it's appropriate. And this is a, um, an award, this is sort of the Oscar of the uh, theater. It's called the Theater for New Audiences. And it's made out of a wonderfully reflective metal that changes color as you change your relationship to it. Let's go on. These are just some other portraits and showing how I took this portrait and took this pattern and made them into a kind of mat around the portrait. And they sort of help each other. This is another portrait, which is a drawing, and another pattern. And combining the two and making a third work that I would not normally do as a conventional process, but I had these two unrelated things, and by forcing them or letting them accommodate themselves into a relationship, they created something I wouldn't have conceptualized this way ordinarily. 
This is one of the very few portraits of Shakespeare in profile. I discovered that going through all the history of Shakespeare that I, uh, I found very few profiles. So I did the profile and I did the pattern and then I combined the pattern and the profile. And a rather naturalistic portrait of Shakespeare and a little grid of uh, just four lines in a row assorted across the surface in different colors and combined, in this case, a series of little iconographic blocks just made the portrait more interesting. Not entirely successful, but you win some, you lose some. A sleeping uh, Shakespeare, I realize I never saw a portrait of Shakespeare asleep. And that combined with this pattern, can't quite see it, makes the drawing a little sweeter. And then I began to do disappearing Shakespeare's because I had these patterns and I had the Shakespeare and I wondered what would happen if he disappeared in front of your eyes. So let's show that. These are the last steps in a series of sequences, which I'll show you. And these are things that I was unsuccessful in trying to sell a client. You find that that will happen to you frequently. This was for the Templeton Foundation, which is a kind of ideological foundation, a little to the right, uh, but they give an award, and this is what I suggested they use for their award. They were not enthusiastic. Let's go on. And they were uh, doing something with a headline about Coney Island. And I thought it'd be funny to do an ad that was all language, only Coney, Coney only, Coney the one and only, or <laughs> Coney Island, stay and smile, Co ye I and, stay and smile, or Coney Island, say it and smile. I love the idea that everything is suitable for transgression, that language and form are all one thing, and you can violate them and make them clearer or less un understandable, but they're all one thing. Let's go on. And here's some ads that I did for them saying that they should do advertising that ex expressed two versions of every idea, that they would be labeled as ideologues if they didn't do that, but if they did, they would be considered to be broad-minded. They actually aren't broad-minded. And they didn't use this campaign. This is sort of something that occurs experiential. It's the two sides of an open magazine or newspaper and the headline is the open mind it says that when you open your mind something happens and we like open-minded people we exist only to gather together etc that's on the left on the right it says the closed mind because you are actually involved in the act of closure when you fold the page so this ad really is you experience the words in a physical way that you bring the physical experience of transformation to the literary experience or the narrative uh, never happened. And this is a, a liquor job that uh, came in two forms, the bottle, or two bottles, that's, they're flat on one side, rounded on the other, and they, are, they take advantage of a back label that you can see dots on because when you move the bottle, the label on the back, those ovals change form. It sort of looks like a school of fish going through the bottle. Never happened. 
And this is the identity for ICALA, the Institute of Contemporary Los Angeles. And the piece here depends on that moment of understanding that occurs a second before you understand what you're looking at. You can actually recognize that the initials there are ICALA. But sometimes you realize that you may only get 20% of your readership understanding, right? That's one of the risks of transgression. And here's some other suggestions for other clients. We do all the Brooklyn beer labeling and packaging, and we thought this ad in the Post, under the heading of the net worth of New York's most desirable couples, which should be pizza and ale, or Black Label Burger and Brooklyn Pilsner and so on, would be funny. Couldn't sell it. Actually, we couldn't sell this for technical issue. You're not allowed to mention food and liquor advertising. I quite like the other one, which is an ad for the uh, uh, Minneapolis uh, Institute, Institute of Arts. And uh, I think it's true. I think if this were on a billboard, you looked at it for 20 seconds, you close your eyes, your leg open, you are no longer the same person. Because if we ever get to talk about what art means, it is only defined by what it accomplishes, not by the intention of the maker. That's why there are so many paintings that you see in galleries and in the museums that are not art. They are something else. And what they are are artifacts the one characteristic that art must have to be real is that it must transform your idea of what is real. If that transformation does not occur, it ain't art, it's something else. And it's not measurable about whether it appears in a gallery or a museum, or if you think of yourself as being an artist. Sorry, but that doesn't make you an artist. It is only measurable by its effect on others, what people respond to. And it's palpable, it's not an illusion. If you go and you sit in front of the Last Supper for five minutes, you are no longer the same person when you leave. And I think that can occur even in a billboard on the street. Not the best circumstances for it, but I think that's a test of its viability. I never used it. Oh, this is just a new uh, logo for the Republicans, the Republicans can't. Republicans, right. Seems particularly appropriate today. No compassion, no solutions. So, and here for the Brooklyn Beer Company, I suggested that they use a beer glass for the, at least a simulation of one, for the opening their warehouse. They weren't up to it. Stumbling in the dark. Here's where the whole question of recognition comes up. I'm very interested in that point, as I told you, between seeing and rec recognition. You look at something, you don't understand what it is, and then suddenly you see it. And a lot of it has to do with tonality. So here are basically just a series of dark prints. Let's go on. and patterning over imagery, and just the highlights off the surface of fruits, and just drawing on a black ground. OK. So that's part one. <laughs> and uh, there's a second part to part one, although we call it part two, which is the process of work. Most people work, particularly designers, work by identifying the problem, having an objective, and then through a series of refined steps, removing everything except the essential answer. Uh, not a bad way to work, but a, not a way that I've ever been able to work. For me, it's something quite different. You, uh, you start the job. First, you 
discover whatever you can about the context, the meaning, the client, and so on. And then you put it at the back of your mind and forget about it. And then you enter on the path, which means you begin to work. And you begin to work literally from anywhere, from that problem, from another problem, from something you might have left off or something. And my idea, it's not my idea, idea of any profound view of human experience. Everything's connected. So it doesn't matter where you start, you're always going to get there. So in this case, uh, this was a poster where it was more about the effect that was produced than persuading somebody. I hate persuasion. I hate telling people what they should do, particularly when it's not of any use to them or good for them. That's why I hate advertising so much. The idea that you're going to tell people to do things that are not necessarily good for them is something that fills me with horror. So here I started with a paper print I had done of Jesus. And then I took it to a blue version, reversing the elements in terms of foreground and background and made a blue version. Then I went back to using the blue. I don't know if you've made monoprints. You cut things out, you ink them, you put them through pressure, and you have a print. It's the most primitive way of printmaking. Let's go on. I thought it wasn't interesting, so I thought maybe I could split the two and do a before and after kind of idea. But it doesn't seem very harmonious to me. So I tried it the other way, flipped it upside down. And this was for this show at the Hermitage. So I put in a lot of copy. I thought the copy might help me, but it didn't. So then I pulled it apart. It was split top and bottom and all left and right. But it wasn't getting any better. So I put a line of copy in. Post past 20 years of the State Hermitage Museum. And there was something interesting about uh, the sort of ticker tape effect of the typography over the image, but it still wasn't coming together. I remembered I had done some scarves. I'd done five scarves that were all related so you could wear them all at once and they would be harmonious. So I said, I think I could use those. And I took the scarves and the imagery and began to fracture them in a series of separate images go. And then I remembered that there was a fantastic Rubens portrait in the Hermitage that I'd always loved. I thought I could introduce that portrait more appropriate than Jesus. So I established a grid with the portrait coming through. And if you squint, you may not have to where you are, you will see the Rubens peeking through the grid. And then I took my scarves and I imposed them on the Rubens and then lightened the tonality of the scarves to create a different spirit. And then I took it another step to amplify some of the color added a little uh, logo that they had for the uh, show and the little image so you'd have a recognition point of the Rubens. And then I think that was the end, right? The one more? That's it. That's the end. What I want to demonstrate here is how circular, irrelevant, and non logical the approaches because that line the mind is the killer of the soul always occurs to me and you will discover that the more logical and rational you are the more difficult it is to deal with the extraordinary that's why i also call it the search for the miraculous because what you hope you'll discover on this road 
is not an answer that could have been anticipated. There's no way to get to this logically. You only stumble into it by going through the experience of getting on the path and just seeing where the path takes you. So who can we start with? Who has a question first? Who's got to make the one up the back there? I'm actually trying to think of what my question will be. I just wanted to um, get your f opinion, feedback on the difference between old school pre-computer designing and designing using a computer, because um, you have done both, and I just wondered how, how they compare. Well, um, as you know, every technology transforms the experience of work uh, in ways that you don't understand. Even the, uh, the act of going from pencil to pen, for instance, requires a shift of consciousness. A pencil can do certain things, and it makes certain demands on you. The softness of the pencil and the rigidity of the pen create different opportunities. Uh, so much so that some people can't work in one or the other, which say they, they say, I don't, I don't use pen. Um, and I've discovered in my own life that you have to accommodate those technologies, whatever they are, uh, if you're interested in changing the nature of your work. You can look at it as a, uh, another means of helping you do what you already do, or, in my case, enables you to do what you wouldn't even think of doing without the technology. I love the computer. That's because I never touch it. <laughs> I never touch the computer. Uh, my smartphone has only six calls on it last year. <laughs> I am a total Luddite, but I know everything about what I want to know about the computer coming out of my experience doing lithographs and the experience I've had through the years of what happens when you put one layer of something over another layer of something else. And the years I spent doing etching and lithography set me up for perfect exploitation of the computer. And the thing I can do with the computer is I can make it do what I would like it to do instead of having it tell me what I should do. The computer is a very skillful enemy. The first you have to do is teach it who's boss. And I might say that almost every case, the computer is boss because it changes your idea of appropriateness of a tonality of shape, of, of course, of time itself. I now work five times as fast as I ever did. Because when you used to do a lithograph, you have to grind the stone, then print it, wait for it to dry, then grind it again, then clean it, then put down the second color. All of this takes you a week to see two color interaction. On a computer, you do it in 30 seconds, <laughs> and then you have something else to do. But the great thing about the computer is you have to use your time well. I mean, you can do stupid things on it just as easy as you can stu do stupid things by hand. Uh, I think it's, it's the most extraordinary shift in an idea of what work can be. But I think at the moment, unless you're skillful enough and have enough history in the basics of what form is, what color is, which are unavoidable issues in terms of your training. You can't come to the computer as an ig ignorant practitioner. You have to get your basic understanding of history, of form, of communication, well developed, because the, the computer is very good at simulating accomplishment. There's so much stuff around computer generated that is trivial, 
but convincingly trivial. So, um, as they often say, computer is a tool, but like all tools, it has to be dominated by your consciousness. And for that, you have to be smart. Next question. Milton, a question that's come through from our text wall, which is how do you get over creative blocks? Creative blocks. Well, first you have to realize that uh, that's an invention, the creative block. It also sounds good. I have a creative block. I can't do anything creative because I'm blocked. What does that mean? <laughs> what do you mean you can't do anything because you're blocked? I can't make fried eggs because I'm blocked. <laughs> hey, do the job for Christ's sake and stop crying. <laughs> I don't believe in creative blocks. It's nonsensical, poetic illusion to make people feel better about the fact that they're either lazy or stupid. <laughs> I think you just have to do the work. And that's what I think, what I was showing you today about a path Stop the work. Stop wallowing in your blocks. <laughs> I don't believe it. I think it's nonsensical. But if you believe it, it exists. If you don't believe it, it vanishes. That's an answer for you. <laughs> <laughs> Next question, please. Oh, we're not peeling the lip. Yet. Hi, Milton. Um, you mentioned before about your disdain for advertising. Um, a lot of us here at Graphics Design at Napier, um, we're going to go into that kind of world very quickly. And I was just wondering, how can you kind of derive a meaningful career from that world, really? Well, here, I've done a lot of advertising uh, through the years. Um, but I think you have to do it consciously. You have to realize that telling things to people that causes them to do things that are harmful to them, like, say, cigarette advertising, although soda drinks come along uh, as well, and also the fact that, you know, very often don't see the consequence of your own behavior in life. You have to be conscious, and you have to acknowledge the fact that you're doing something to hurt people. If I'm on a cigarette account, I want to be able to say I'm ashamed of the fact, but I move people towards doing things that will hurt them in their lives. And I do that voluntarily because I want to be famous and I want to make a lot of money. And that's my view of what life is and that's what I stand for. Perfectly all right with me. Acknowledgement is the first step. You have to acknowledge what it is you do and take the consequence. Otherwise, denial is a form of murder. What you're doing is you're encouraging people to smoke cigarettes. I'll use the most obvious example, although there are a million others, to smoke cigarettes, and you don't care what happens to them. And that's why I'm always anxious to distinguish between persuasion and information. It seems to me that one of the best things we can do in our life is inform people. Inform people. You inform them so they can choose what it is they want to choose and choose what is good for them, or if not good for them, at least what they have decided upon. But the idea of using tricks and jokes and colors to move people towards things that are not good for them strikes me as being something that eats at the heart and pulls you away from the, what I think the central impulse of design and art are, which is to help others and to create a community the great role that art plays when it's art, and I mentioned what is not art, but when art occurs in the work that you do, and it may not occur all the time or even frequently, it provides a common agenda for people so they feel they are part of something larger than their own narcissistic selves. That's a good job. And if you're in the world of fame and money, and God knows that's a very attractive world. At least acknowledge that's what you're doing. Wilton, can I ask you, where, where do you come to the point when you, you realize, and I know you have worked in collaborations before, where does it come to the point 
that is a collaboration or someone interfering what is something that's heartfelt to you? Say that again. I didn't it's, understand it's, that somebody's... You know, I, I know on many uh, occasions you've had collaborations with other artists and with other individuals. Do you find it difficult finding that point between it's a collaboration of equals or one mind stronger than the other? It's a hypothetical question that I don't know how to answer. I mean, the issue is that when you have two people, they're very different people with different capabilities, uh, and every situation is unique. I mean, the person, you might work well with one person and not well with another. If you ever read my little uh, essay on what I've learned, the first thing I learned about this profession and everything else was work only with people you like. And I think the uh, having an affectionate relationship is the beginning of everything. Having an acrimonious relationship is the end of everything. So I think what you have to do is you have to choose your collaborator very carefully. And sometimes it's not obvious, because sometimes you have uh, people who work by tension, work by contrast, work by disagreement. But ultimately, what they produce determines whether you've been successful or not. You have shown us a lot of examples of uh, pieces that perhaps the commissioner or the client didn't go for it. Which piece are you most interested or gave you more development or you were sort of the proudest of that perhaps the commissioner, the client didn't go for it? It's a very complex question you're asking me. Mm -hmm. But I might tell you something. I don't, I don't think about what I've done uh, or think about fixing it or going back. Uh, I also don't have very many preferences about my work. You know, it's done, it's done, it's over. Uh, on to the next. I really find uh, the great thing about our professional life is that there's always another job to be done. And that uh, you, eventually you build up a history, you like some things, you dislike. I'm embarrassed by some things I've done, but I recognize it as being all I could do at that time. Uh, I have, I've been put, trying to put my finals in order. I've done so many stupid things. Fortunately, you haven't seen all of them. But, um, Again, the issue is who you're working with. If your client is sympathetic and looks on the experience as a voyage that you're both going on together, that's one thing. If your client thinks that you're around basically to express an idea that you have and you'll, he'll recognize it when he sees it, that's trouble. Milton, can I ask you one thing? The stupid things you've done, do you feel you had to do them to do the good things you've done? I, I can't make that kind of unequivocal determination. I, I think the stupid things I've done is just that day I was stupid <laughs> or I misunderstood. But equally, I would imagine when you were doing the stupid things, you still thought they were the greatest things you were about to do. Well, you hope you learn as a part of the experience of being around. I've been around a hundred years, so at the end of that time, you hope you're not diminished sufficiently so that you're embarrassed by what you're doing. Mm -hmm. Actually, I have to say, I like the work I'm doing now. I have great enthusiasm and energy for it still, which surprises the hell out of me. <laughs> but I think maintaining at a certain point in your life, and you'll all discover this, you have a, a kind of limited amount of energy to spend your time and also the frightful sense that you may be declining in your understanding or uh, ability to work. And that's a little scary, but I don't feel that yet. And I take it there's no sign of retirement. <laughs> so, no, I don't. Uh, the, the word that gives me uh, more, creates more fear in my body other than Donald Trump <laughs> is retirement. I mean, if I didn't have some place to go in the morning, I don't know what I'd do. We have a, a couple more questions just came in from the, the text wall. 
Uh, when I look at all the creative recombination of ideas in your work, I wonder how you retain familiarity with all your works and how often you dig around in your old designs to look for new links. Never. <laughs> I mean, although it's all in my brain, and that very often now what I find, I can remember an old drawing that I did that may be applicable to a new situation, and I, I have no embarrassment about doing that. Uh, we were, in fact, just doing this before. The, I was asked to do a cover for a food magazine about the re-emergence of France. And it occurred to me I had done a portfolio of drawings in France based on um, Monet. So I just sent over five Monet drawings to the art director of this food magazine. I'll do that shamelessly because, because I have them. But I don't dig around in what I've done before. It doesn't seem to me profitable. If you were in this audience tonight as a young Milton, what advice would you give? I know what it's a really would I give? heavy weight question, but just in simple terms, if it was a young I'll Milton sitting here tonight. Same advice, work hard and do good work. I mean, what else is there? You have to learn what you're doing. You have to work like hell every day. My whole life is about my wife and my work. That's all there is. There's nothing else in it, right? Coming to work in the studio, being surrounded by people I like, uh, don't, let, don't let the inevitable pull of fame and money divert you from your essential soul. Don't give up the fact that making things is the most noble and extraordinary thing that you could do. There's no compensating that through fame or money. Uh, easy to say, but it's really true. If you abandon your work for money or fame, you will not be happy. Uh, okay, on to this gentleman's question. If, if you're uh, going down a certain path, uh, for example, um, uh, I ask, um, let's just say you have a certain goal in mind, and uh, in going towards that goal, you deviate from that path be, um, in terms of uh, not uh, trying to reach that goal, you, you find another goal, and then you find another different goal, but you realize that the first goal is the goal that you originally wanted to get. Is how do you bring yourself back to start again? Or what do you do? Well, that's good, because it really relates to what I was saying. You're going down a path, and you don't know exactly what the goal is. You have a general sense of where you want to be, but what you do is you let the goal take you to where you really want to be without knowing it. What I mean is that you don't have an idea what the destination is. But what you have is a way of moving towards something. And that idea of that motion, that you don't have to, for one thing, have a loyalty to style. Right? One of the things that I see very characteristic of the field is that people feel they have to be loyal to their style. They own a style. That becomes property. It's a commodity. And you have to deliver that to your client because that's the way you define yourself. If that's the case, you're going to have to do the same thing for your whole life. And if that's all right with you, it's all right with me. But I, I found I went nuts if I did that. If I did too much cartooning or too much illustration or too much watercolor or too much restaurant design or too much architecture, suddenly I realized I didn't have to do any of that, that, that the choice of what I wanted to do was open as long as my, eye, my mind and eyes were open to it. But if my mind and eyes had already established what I felt was appropriate for me, in that case it was a certain kind of cross hatch drawing in soft tonality, that would be my life. So that question of where you go is based on your own open-mindedness to your own potential. Thank you. OK, next question, please. Yep, gentleman here. Milton, towards the start of your presentation, you told us that there are no unconnected things, that all things are related. And yet, in the world today, increasingly, it seems that we have fragmentation even disintegration. How do you see the future? 
our future? Yes. You mean if Trump gets elected? <laughs> um, I try not to think too much about the future. My wife is always thinking about the future. What are we going to have for dinner tonight? <laughs> or who's going to be elected? Or suppose the electricity fails. Um, I think this idea that you hear frequently of being in the present is a great solution. Paying attention to where you are, breathing, listening, encountering, embracing is the answer to your anxiety about the future. Staying in the present prevents you from worrying about the future. At the same time, you act towards shaping that future. But not with fear, not with apprehension, because those are drugs that prevent you from acting. So my response to what's going to happen is to pay attention to what is happening. Next question, please. Help here. Just now. If a client doesn't like what you produced, how do you deal with that? Do you rework it to the specs and the brief? Do you tell them to come around to see your point of view? Do you get to a stage where you can't reach a compromise and, and you drop it, or, or how do you how do you how do you work with that? You want me to tell you one of the great professional secrets of all time? Please. There's no answer to your question. Right. Remember, you are with someone else trying to solve their problem, right? So above all, you have to approach that with an open mind. And the most difficult thing is to understand what their problem is as opposed to what they think it is. And then you have to establish a relationship that, as I said earlier, is one when you feel that the two of you are involved in a common objective, not a contrary objective. You're not interested in just what typeface you use. You're interested in solving the client's problem. And very often, you don't know, and a lot of designers don't know what the client's problem is. And the client is frequently smarter than you are. So what you have to do is really accept the relative intelligence and capability of the partners in this effort. It's no different than any other partnership. If you partner with another designer to, to do a brochure together, you still have a conversation between two people who don't necessarily have the same point of view. And I think every situation changes with the nature of the personalities of the people involved. Some people you have to be very firm and say, I can't do that. I don't believe it'll work. And some people you have to say, I'll do that because you want it, but I don't believe it. And some people you just shut up and do it. Every case is different. I think you have to be very careful. There was a piece recently, uh, maybe six months ago, about somebody who said, the best advice for designers is never have a job. And I think to a large extent that's true because a job forces you to do things in a way that you may not agree with or be hospitable to her. So that's not a possibility for a lot of people. If you're a freelancer, which is a relatively small percentage of our design population, but the most important because freelancers have a certain degree of autonomy, which just causes them to be able to say no, which you usually don't have on a job. And that ability to say no is one way you can protect your own integrity and the quality of your work. How you do that in terms of the individual relationship is something that can't be generalized. It's so different in every case. What you do is understand your, and try to make your client understand that your objective is a common one, and you're really in agreement about what success is. But the methodology might be different, and there you might have to 
justify a methodology. Thanks. Hi, Milton. Um, you mentioned earlier that when you were showing some of your examples um, that art and graphic design, you thought it was great for informing people about things. Um, and that's really what people working in the field of information visualization are doing now, trying to take data and show it graphically so that people can explore it to, to learn about um, whatever the field that, that the information represents is. But you also um, mentioned or pointed out the problem of people seeing things um, in the graphics that aren't actually there. And of course, that can cause a problem of misinforming or misunderstanding um, in people. Do you have any insights or views that um, the information visualization field could um, learn from to try to avoid the problem um, that can be caused by this you know, feature of perception causing people to see things that aren't there in the, the graphics that we could help to make better visualizations? Uh, I, th I don't think I could give you a general answer to that. I mean, First of all, one of the problems is, is everything people see, they see through their own experience and physicality, which is to say that I, I'm convinced that no two people see color the same. So when somebody says, oh, I like that yellow, the guy next door says, I don't like that yellow, and the next one says, I sort of like that yellow. What are you talking about? We don't have any idea whether what they're looking at has any relationship to what we're seeing which is one of the things that adds enormous complexity to even the simplest problem. So the question of preference is a very complex preference. Uh, it's so evasive that very often you're showing something where you can't get any agreement. And as you know, the more people you get involved in the process of approval, the less likely it is you'll ever get an approval. I've just gone through this with designing identity for one of the states in America. And every time we added another person to the bureaucratic process until there were 12 people involved in making a decision on anything that was submitted, no possibility of any agreement ever. So uh, you have to understand both the peculiarities of the human understanding system, uh, the way eyes work, which is not understandably uh, revealed, uh, the difficulty uh, with people's own emotional responses to things that you have no insight into. I think I'll get out of this field. <laughs> Milton, I suppose no one can have a lecture or an interview with you without coming back to iHeartNY. And it's just what you were saying there about having, you know, a committee decide or the amount of people, you know, agreeing on a finished product. Now, I do believe when you, you created the, the I Heart NY, you scribbled it on a piece of paper. How difficult was that to convince the city to use it? Say that last part again. How, how difficult was it? No New York City, how difficult was it for the city to agree to use it? I'll tell you how, that was so freakish. Uh, but it's an indication of what happens. A guy came to me from Hong Kong. He came to my desk. He said, we want to do a campaign for New York because it was in 77. Everybody was moving uh, out. There was dog shit all over the street. People were being mugged when they went out for an evening walk and so on. So a campaign had to be launched. And he came with the words, I love New York which a lot of people claim to have originated. Uh, and I did something uh, in a week, and it was submitted and approved by whatever committee they had. And then the following week, I was in a cab going to work, and I realized that what I'd done was stupid and that there was a better way of doing it, and that's where the I heart New York, I scribbled on a little piece of paper because it was so obvious. And I called him up and I said, what happened uh, to that uh, proposal? He said, oh, they accepted it. I said, do me a favor. I have something better. He said, oh, no, I can't go back to them now. They approved it. I said, let me show you. So I went down. I showed this guy. His name was Bill Doyle. I said, look at this. He said, you're right. That's better. <laughs> and he went back to the board, reconvened them. They met again, and they approved it. Uh, I spent in total, I would say, 
three hours on that, from beginning to end to doing it over. Uh, it was seamless, flawless, and outside of my argument with it, unresisted. And that's what happened. And it was the easiest presentation I'd ever made in my life. And, and have you ever kept a piece of paper that you scribbled it on? Or is it in MoMA? Yeah, I know. <laughs> and, and I, I hope I don't speak out of turn here. Milton, has, he donated that to the city. He gave it over to the city. Uh, so he's never received anything from that. Other than you did change over a period the mind of a city. The city started to look at itself and the people started to look at itself. And to, I suppose there's no greater reward than to say I changed how New York thought of itself. So that's pretty cool. Uh, we have another question from the Riyadh, just the, the last two or three more questions. That's it, guys. Um, this is a question from a fourth year student. Are there any new designers today who you like or who inspire you? No, I never, I never answer that question. There are a lot of good young designers, a lot of good old designers. Um, I don't look for the design field for inspiration. I look at uh, things that have nothing to do with design because, as I keep saying, everything is related. And when I talked about a 16th century Persian rug, that is inspirational. I just saw a show of my old teacher, Morandi, in New York. And I went into that room and I was totally transformed. Even though I loved Morandi before I went there, I realized the extraordinary gift that he gives us all of being able to discover what is real. You know, we all live in illusion and a distortion of reality. And when art presents us with the opportunity to see what is real, it's unforgivable, uh, un unimaginable. And uh, it's not like other things. It's not like other experiences. It's not like designing a beer bottle. It has another meaning and another effect on you. But uh, there are a lot of good practitioners around uh, you know, the School of Visual Arts has thousands of students. Whether the work they produce is life enhancing or not is yet to be determined. I, I think that's a good place to finish on. Can I just say thank you very much to, obviously, Milton and you guys for joining us tonight? Can I ask you to again put your hands together for Milton? Please.